Welcome to Liberating Faith Podcast. I'm so glad that you have tuned in to listen. I'm Dr. Michael Stenhammer, and I have studied the Word of Faith movement for a number of years. I was part of it. I've done a lot of research. And I want to share some thoughts and insights here that might be of help to you. So listen in and see what you think. So what is the biblical story? Well, what, because it, we're saying that you can live out of a story and story shapes your identity and your, your values and, and you know, your purpose and your agency. What then is God's story of the world? Well, thank you for asking, okay? Because this is where you come into a clash with the Word of Faith story. The Word of Faith story is not fully wrong. Okay, it's, it, it still has elements that are really biblical. So I'm not saying that, and that's why I don't agree with everybody who says that this is just a full heresy. It's more complicated than that. And, and you'll hear me speak to that in different places. I, I, I wish it was so easy to e say it's either black or white, right? But it, it's more complicated than that. But, so, but there are some major problems with how the Word of Faith gives their story of the world, how they teach uh, the the you know the biblical story, and I, I just I, I want to point out some of those things later on. But first, I want to look at the biblical story. What is the biblical story then? If we're living out of a story, what is the biblical story? Well, basically, you can say it this way: that God's big story of the world is to share God's life and God's reign with us in God's renewed creation. Okay. That's a very short definition of God's greatest story. God's desire to share God's life and God's reign and God's rule, His kingdom, with us in God's renewed creation. That is the big kingdom story. That's the big story of the Bible. And I want to break this down a little bit and, and look at it and, and just keep this in mind that, first of all, God's story is future-oriented. This is absolutely incredibly important to see that when I said that God desires to share his life and God's reign and rule with us in God's new world, you can see right away that the story is not yet fully fulfilled. We are not yet there. Okay, through Jesus, it has begun. Through Jesus and the, the, the coming of the Spirit, th this has been inaugurated, this has begun, but we are not in its fullness. So that means the story is not yet complete and we are in an ongoing story that is reaching for its fulfillment in the coming of Jesus. Okay, this is extremely, extremely important that the God story is future oriented and future looking and that there is that momentum towards the future. Most people would not disagree with that. And they say, yeah, 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 Michael, we know that, uh, you know, heaven is the future. Well, no, not really. Heaven has been taken in as just a metaphor for the future. And we have not really been good at unpacking what that really means. I'm going to come back to that too later on, but I want you to see here that it's the future orientation of sharing God's life and God's reign in God's renewed creation. That is the future towards which we're going. Okay, that means that the story is eschatological. You, I don't know where you come from. I don't know, you, you know, how do you react to these theological terms? Some people, they shy away from them and feel that, oh, these big words and theologians, they're always throwing these, you know, big terms around. And, and they, they think, well, it's just, you know, everything should just be simple and, and just, you know, stay away from these terms. I, I, don't, I don't agree with that logic because I follow Paul saying that we should go from immaturity to maturity. And I find that, not, that some of these terms are extremely helpful thinking tools. The way to, to mature is also to learn some of, these, uh, some of these terms that can be so, so helpful. So I don't find that there are any value of throwing around terms that sound educated. And, and so I'm not after that. But I also want us to be empowered so that we don't have to blindly follow somebody else. Because the moment you say, well, that sounds too complicated. I'm not going to get into that. You just handed over agency to somebody else. <laughs> you just did. You just let somebody else make some tougher decisions. All right. And make somebody else get into the nitty gritty. And, and, and that will really affect you. So I find it better just learn some of this stuff and, 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 and be empowered by them. So eschatological or eschatology is one of those great words that will really empower you. And if this is the first time you say it, say it loud and say it proud, you know, eschatology. But it, what it does is that for most people, they think about Antichrist and all these things. And that's a little part, a, a little, little part of eschatology. But when I talk about eschatology, I 
talk about God's final end, what, where the story is ending towards its ultimate fulfillment, whether it be a rapture, an antichrist, uh, you know, a millennium, all those things are important. But that's just, you know, what's happening before the big end or the big future fulfillment, which is God's ultimate goal. And I'm here more interested in the ultimate eschatological end than just what happens before that. Okay, so, uh, you know, so when I say eschatology here, I'm talking about God's final future. And Chris Wright is a blessed uh, theologian and Old Testament scholar. He had a very good point. He said when he was talking about the importance of realizing how the biblical story is future oriented. It's heading towards the future. OK, and the Holy Spirit is God's eschatological spirit. What I mean by that is that the Holy Spirit, of course, is the third person of the Trinity, but the Holy Spirit is bringing us towards the future, is the power of God's future in the present that is just just empowering us and, and just moving us towards God's goal. OK, so when we want to have a life that is spirit filled, we should have a life that is aligning with God's or eschatological orientation and and drive okay and he says this you cannot drive a car looking only in the rear view mirror well that, that doesn't seem like a great insight does that i mean we, you had to learn that very early in driving school or otherwise you never get your driver's license but basically this has a lot of theological weight because most christians they drive their car the christian car not looking towards the future they look somewhere else okay and most or the word of faith the prosperity gospel they definitely do not look towards the future their the word of faith car in a sense is is empowered by the past it looks backwards and sees uh that we are now restored to the the dominion of of adam and Eve were now restored through Jesus to the original uh, dominion and the original blessing and the original uh, authority and prosperity and divine health and, and the power of creative speech, all that oh, from the Garden of Eden, we are restored to now. So the power in that story is a, a going back story. It's a protological story. It's going back. And he says that all these things are there for you if you only have faith. Faith is the only thing that stands between you and the realization of all these things that are already there. And I'm going to speak to this later on and unpack it more. But you can see that that story is very different from the biblical story that says that we have tasted a little bit of the ultimate future, which is sharing the life of God in the reign of God in the new creation of God. That's a future-oriented story. And that sets our agenda very, very differently. Because that means that in this life, we are practicing for this, this future that is still ahead of us. In the word of faith, you're not practicing for it. You're claiming it. And you're meant to live it now. That is a radically different interpretation of the biblical story. But let me give you a few things that will hopefully help you to see that how I just summarize the biblical story is actually uh, anchored within Scripture. I began by saying that God's ultimate desire is to share His life with us, that we will participate in the life of God, in the life of the triune God, to be in union with God. And some theological uh, schools or traditions use the word theosis to speak about partaking of the life. And there are two scriptures that are, uh, you know, very important here. In John 17, 20, for example, and to 23, Jesus says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. I find that to be very encouraging because that includes you and me. So Jesus prayed for you. you Jesus prayed for me. Uh, you know, specifically in this verse, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, that is union, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So there will be a, a unity among the believers, but that unity will lead to union and participation in the life of God. I have given them the glory that you, yet, that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So Jesus sets here the agenda that the future goal is participation and union 
in God, in the life of God. Peter speaks of this in 2 Peter 1.4. He says, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that, so, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. So participation in God, in the divine nature. Well, what's interesting, though, is that if you're listening to the Word of Faith, they're actually touching on some of these things, right? You have that teaching of little gods, of being little gods. I mean, that that's a teaching that kind of flourished early on in the faith and prosperity gospel. And it's still there in, in some circles. Uh, some people have shied away from it, but it's still there. And there's also that idea that Adam shared in God's DNA and Adam partook, and Adam and Eve partook of God's very nature, that God took something of himself and created Adam and Eve. Well, I, I believe that's a total overreading of Genesis. That's not what Genesis teaches. But can you see that it's coming very close to our ultimate goal of participation in God? Even as Peter says, so participation in the divine nature. So there, there is a, a, a point here where the word of faith has, has, has caught something. That there is something in God, in God's story, of God sharing his very life with us. His very, that we'll participate in his nature. That doesn't mean that there will be, you know, a... a the division between creator and creation will be erased. Of course not. We will participate in the life of God still as creatures. We'll participate in the life of the creator as creatures. That uh, distinction is never erased. But in, in, in Word of Faith, sadly, that is erased somehow. But, but coming back to this, so there, I will give them some credit that the Word of Faith has picked up on some of these things that many Christians before were shy of even putting words to. All right. But when they found out that maybe we're going to partake of the very life of God and in the nature of God, they put it in the beginning of the story, not at the end of the story. And the moment they put it at the beginning of the story, they force it to happen now through Jesus. And it creates this, this subverted story that overstates our status right now. And that place an extreme expectation on believers now. It places us in a in in a, in a in a story that is not true to this world. It's not true to our human experience because we are not yet there. And it, this is because they overread the beginning of Genesis. Okay, so sharing in the life of God. So when you come to later on, you'll find also that God not only one does God wants us to participate in His life. God wants us to participate in his reign and his rule. Listen to Jesus again in Luke 22, 28 and 30. He says, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So what is happening here is that Jesus says that he is uh, conferring a kingdom on his disciples, that they will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. They will sit together and rule and reign with Christ, rule and reign in the kingdom of God with the Messiah. He says that that's what he's doing. That's what he's giving the gift as to the disciples. And in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul expands this interpretation when he speaks to the Corinthians who are not uh, ethnic Jews. He speaks to them and says that, don't you know that you will judge the world. Okay, so this is the, that we will share in Christ's reign is not just over the 12 tribes of Israel. It will be over the whole world. God wants us and invites us into participate in his life and his rule in his reign. Oh, isn't that amazing? What an amazing story. What an amazing God that invites us to participate in this. And man, are we not worthy of that. Oh, what a beautiful future we have. How amazing isn't that? But let's listen to a few more scriptures here. In 2 Timothy 2.12, Paul writes, If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. But notice it says, if we endure, we will also what? Reign with him. Our future is to participate in the reign with God. Revelation 3.21 this is the, you know, the, 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 the beautiful um, 
phrase of, of Jesus here. He says, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. He says, to the one who's victorious, the one who holds fast to, to love and trust in him, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. So the future here is the right to sit and share the rule of Christ. If you want to go deeper in some of these things, you can read, uh, you, you know, chapter 7 of Daniel. You'll get some of these things too of, of the, the, the rule of the Messiah being shared also with his people. So Daniel chapter 7 is a, is a powerful text to read there. But what, coming back to the word of faith then, they're saying too, they will still also agree that we will reign with Christ, right? That we will be having dominion. That's, that's a big part of the prosperity gospel. I mean, that's one reason why, you know, prosperity is even there because it's a sign that you're ruling and reigning, right? That you're, uh, you know, victorious and successful and that you have financial abundance and, and health and, and, you know, all these things are signs that you are ruling, that you share the reign of Christ, that you're seated, uh, you know, at, at the right hand of Christ. So what about that? Are we reigning now? Because the, in the Word of Faith, the Prosperity Gospel, Ephesians 2, 6 is a key scripture where, where Paul says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus. And, and I don't know how many times I heard this verse quoted over and over again, that we are seated with Him in heavenly realms. We're seated with Christ. Oh, you know, I, I heard it in Bible school. I man, I heard it so so many times. This 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 text that we are that we are ruling and reigning with Christ, and He has raised us up together, has made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. That in that sense, we're we're right now. The the, the teaching is that because we're seated with Christ, we are now ruling with Christ. And, and you know, taken from that comes you know the quotations from Romans five seventeen that we are we will reign in life. That's a key text as well, where Paul says, For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, how much more uh, those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ? And, and the teaching goes in, 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 the, in the word of faith that we are now there. We are now reigning with Christ. We are there to reign because that's what Ephesians 2, 6 says. And Romans 5, 17 says we are now the kings and we are now reigning, right? The problem, though, is that we're getting into the way the word of faith often misinterprets Scripture. And they have, they have a problem with Bible interpretation. And this is one thing that kind of keeps the movement, you know, doing all these turns and, and, and theological decisions is that they are not really doing a proper job of interpreting the Bible. They are not really taking the Bible as seriously as they think they are. And I'm not saying that they do this knowingly and intentionally, not at all. Uh, I believe they are very good and honest, uh, most of them. And, and so I'm not blaming them, but they need to take responsibility for the way they interpret the Bible because the, these texts are misinterpreted. Ephesians 2, 6, and I'll show you in a moment, is misinterpreted it, because it breaks two of the most fundamental um, principles or uh, guidelines of Bible interpretation. The first one is context, that you cannot plug, just take any verse out of a context to make it mean whatever you want to say. I mean, if you do just Ephesians 2, 6, you cut it out and say that Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms, you can just stop right there and then build a doctrine on that, build a teaching on that. Yes, you can, but you need to factor in more than just that verse. Just read verse 7. Just read verse 7 of Ephesians 2, which says this, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of His grace, expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So you see then, if you factor in verse 7 of Ephesians 2, 6, that this is not just something that is fully completed. This is the beginning of something. This is the, the start of us sharing the rule and the reign with Christ. But it's not yet in fullness because the, the progression is still eschatological, reaching towards the future of the coming ages. Another principle that, that Word of Faith is breaking all the time is the, the principle of letting Scripture interpret Scripture. 
that means that, and of course that fits within context as well, right? But that means that you, you're looking for other places in the Bible to, to let the things that are more clear to shed light on what's more obscure and difficult. And even here, the, the, the level of context that you go from verse, you go into the surrounding verses, you go to the chapter, and then you go to the book. Then, of course, you go to the Testament and then the other Testament and then the whole biblical story. I mean, all these things had to factor in when you interpret the Bible. But if you look just in the chapter ahead of Ephesians 1, in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 2, if you look in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, listen to what Paul says here. He says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. What does he say? He says, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit that guarantees our inheritance until the redemption. So Paul is saying, we are not yet fully there. You're born again and you're given life through the Holy Spirit. You're born through the Spirit. But that doesn't mean you are yet in the fullness of what God has intended for us, of sharing His life and sharing His reign. But the Spirit is the deposit that guarantees this inheritance, which Paul speaks in other places of as sharing His glory. Especially in Romans 8, he speaks about that, of partaking of His glory. So again, the, the orientation of all these promises is still future-oriented. It's still driving us towards God's final, uh, the final reign or the final rule of God, which is still eschatological in the future. The word of faith misreads this as being now. And the moment you do that, you have, you have bought into a false story. And that story will be a taskmaster. That story will cripple you. It will hinder you at the end. It will bite you. It sounds very sweet in the beginning. It will taste very sweet that, wow, Man, am I to rule and reign now in the name of Jesus? Can I claim and can I command? Can I have prosperity and divine health now? Yes. Wow. So when the first time you hear these messages, they are amazingly enticing. They are as enticing as in Genesis chapter 3, when the, the Satan came with a twisted narrative. And they will, they will, even as it did with Eve, it enticed her desire and it reshaped her love and her heart was set on eating the fruit to become like God. The same thing with the word of faith narrative. It has that power to penetrate and enter your heart and transform your desires and to shape them, but not shape them eschatologically towards the future. It shapes them to something that has already happened and just to the now. So you begin to expect everything of that now. And the moment you have that expectation, you will now start to search for the principles and the keys that will make that a reality now. And, the, and your life will be a failure until you can somehow believe that you're living that reality. But if that's not the true story of the world, you will never enter into it. Because that's not even possible because we're not even not yet there. That's not to deny, of course, that the Holy Spirit is present. And the Holy Spirit gives us foretastes of the future. And the deposit of the Spirit in our lives is not just a passive deposit. It, the Holy Spirit is active, transforming us and bringing us first fruits of these realities so that we can see the first fruits of the kingdom of God among us. I believe that. I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles of, of healing and miracles of provision and all these things. I believe in that. But that's not to say that we are right now ruling in life, that we are now ruling as kings in this life. So even looking at Romans 5, 5 17, it has the future tense that we that those who have received uh, the gift of righteousness will reign in life. In Greek, basilevosin, uh, oh sorry, basil, uh, ah, I misread it, but basilevosin, that's the Greek future tense, will reign. It's not reigning now, it's will reign. It's the same thing as we found in, in, in Revelation 3.21, where Jesus says, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. And in, in Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2.12, they will also reign with him. And in Luke 22, it's a future promise 
of sitting on his throne and judging the tribes of Israel. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul's, Paul's encouragement is a future that we will, that we are to in the future to judge the world, will judge. Do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? It's still an eschatological promise of a future judging of the world. So these are two of the main important dimensions of God's big story of sharing his life and his rule. And you can see right away how the word of faith comes close, very close, but still so far away. And it's, you might say it's a uh, interpretation, the difference in degrees, sure, but those degrees make a world of difference. Where, how you construct, which story empowers these goals? Is it a story that is protological, as in the word of faith, saying that this has already happened and you can have them by faith now? Or is it an eschatological story, which is the biblical story, says that this is our future hope and towards this we are striving? In Hebrews 11, that sets us into this story of faith, that we are like the faith heroes of Old Testament who sees the future afar off, that will not yet see that promise fulfilled in this life, we will die in hope. We will die in hope to share the life of God, to share the reign of God. And we are preparing for this hope. That's why we live a life of humility and holiness. Because we know that one day, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, don't you know that you will judge the angels? And uh, within that question is that imperative of living a holy life, of a, a prepared life. How can we compromise now? How can we live in sin now if we are to even judge the angels? I don't know if that speaks to you. It doesn't speak to my wife. My wife says, well, hey, you know, uh, you know, it, it doesn't speak to her imagination. Uh, other things does. I mean, she really has a beautiful eschatological perspective and she can explain this much better than I can. She's using great images. But to me, this, this image of judging the angels, man, it, it sets me on a trajectory of wanting to live a holy life. How can I watch this junk on YouTube or Netflix if I'm going to judge the angels? I cannot, you know? I need to speak truth. I need to live a holy life, you know? And not because otherwise God will not love me or otherwise, you know, da da da, da as in, in a law-centered uh, way of living. No, I want to do it because I want to live according to my high and holy calling. I want to, as Paul says, live worthy of my calling, right? So our calling is to rule the world with Christ, to share the life of God. That even more so calls me to holiness. I want to live a holy life because I am to share the very life of God. And God is holy. Be holy as I am holy. So my motivation for holiness is the eschatological motivation. It's not law-based. It's based on my hope and my promise, right? Humility becomes a priority because the way I read the Bible is I practice for uh, my dominion by, by withdrawing and being humble now. I, I lay down my, my entitlements. I lay down my rights here by self-giving love and service as preparation to rule and reign with Christ. Not that, that ruling and reigning would be different. It is a rule and reign in, in true humility because the cross shows us how Christ truly reigns by self-giving love, right? But this means that the, the biblical story empowers me into humility and holiness. Those do not really exist within the word of faith. Humility and holiness are not there. That's why we see a lot of arrogance, a lot of pride. We see a lot of sin going on. Because the story in itself does not privilege humility and holiness. We need a biblical story that empowers these things. Because Jesus says it's the meek who will inherit what? The world, right? And without holiness, nobody will see the Lord. So we need to enter the biblical story and to identify stories that are not really true, that are not really empowering us. If you want to enter into the Bible, from the perspective of story and you want to you know how can i get a, a fuller grasp on the whole biblical story and things like that i recommend the drama of scripture the drama of scripture written by craig bartholomew and michael gohan 
uh, and it's it's published by uh, I think in the U.S. I, I get the British edition. It's published by SPCK, and I think it's Baker or something in the U.S. But you will find it very easily. The drama scripture, and they just came out I think with a third edition, and uh, they are just retelling the bi biblical story, uh, and it's a very good start. Again, that you might always want to think about how people retell the biblical story. So I'm not saying that maybe you know I agree on everything or I think they hit everything. I think there are different ways of doing it, but these books are helpful tools to get into these dimensions of thinking. So I hope that this podcast has been a blessing to you. Reach out to me at www.liberating.faith. I'd love to hear your story. I'd love to hear your input and your comments. If you have things you want me to, to somehow address in, in, in podcasts or in videos, let me know. Until I see you in videos and podcasts, God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.